video channel about making all things beautiful and useful. My name is Anushka, you can find me elsewhere online as The Crimson Stitchery and relevant links for this video can be found in the down bar here below on YouTube. This video, which is this month's edition of my regular making things vlog, my knitting podcast, whatever you want to call it, is coming to you courtesy of all of my lovely and wonderful supporters over on Patreon who are keeping this channel going. So thank you so much. Um, creating YouTube videos is quite a lot of work and it can take anything between eight and 30 hours per video. So, you know, you can work out how many working days that ends up being. And I I really really couldn't do it without you. So thank you so much and if you're enjoying the Crimson Stitchery you might consider being one of my patrons. Um, head over to patreon.com forward slash the Crimson Stitchery to check out all of the different tier benefits and choose the right tier for you. Now, just a quick news flash before I get into everything that I've been making, which is I have an extra big thank you to my patrons this month because I have not one, but two microphones. I've managed to buy a really, really fantastic piece of kit, which is this pair of wireless lapel mics, which is going to make recording so much better and so much better quality, trust me. And for everybody who watched my recent Ask Me Anything vlog in the garden, over there will know it turns out that recording outdoors is technically very difficult and very different from recording in a wet living room. Um, by wet, we mean that the sound is very bouncy and echoey because there's lots of hard surfaces as opposed to being dry, um, where things like carpets would absorb the sound. So yeah, in a wet room like this, sound-wise, um, sound carries really, really well, but outdoors, it's completely different. And you'll be delighted to know that these Pell mics came with a wind um, filter. It's called a dead cat. It's not a dead cat. It's um, clearly made. It's clearly like a fake fur pom pom. But anyway, it's a special device that clips onto the mic um, and prevents the wind from disturbing the internal mechanisms, all of the wires and so forth. So hooray! This was a very significant piece of kit and one that I am so glad that I made because it's going to make doing things outdoors and just doing things out and about out so much better and on that note I do actually have something interesting planned so watch this space <laughs> honestly I feel like I've made so many plans for the Crimson Stitchery and it's true what they say you know when you're starting out like freelancing and stuff and you ask for advice about how much to charge or whatever people always say to take how long you think something's going to take and triple it and then send that bill estimation to the client and it's so true I I just it's been a learning curve let's just put it that way um, and also quite different from you know when I was just make when I was just starting out and just experimenting with YouTube and seeing if it was something that I liked doing or not um, and then now when I'm like actually yes I do like doing it I think the Crimson Stitchery is awesome and I want to move forward and try and actually see if it can really be part of my studio practice like my creative practice in general um, yeah so massive learning curve especially this year and again a big thank you to everybody who has supported the channel. Okay, so that is that very, very exciting announcement. I feel like maybe some people might be like, why are you so excited? It's just a microphone. But trust me, it's not just a microphone. It's really, really excellent. I think sound quality is one of those things where you almost take it you almost take it for granted but it's actually very very technical and very difficult to get right and very important to get right and I did not train in videography or filmmaking I trained you know in making things by hand um, I trained in textiles and honestly sometimes I say to my partner like oh I should have just done media studies or journalism or filmmaking or videography and he was like yeah but if you did all of those things you wouldn't have anything to make films about. So I was like, oh yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a very, very good point. So anyway, now let's move on to what I've got in my knitting basket. And eagle-eyed eagle -eyed viewers are gonna spot a piece of crochet here. And I know that my crochet viewers are gonna be very happy because you guys have been, I don't wanna say nagging, 
Um, very, you guys have been very enthusiastic about trying to encourage me to do more crochet for quite a long time and clearly it's paid off so anyway we'll get to that in good time. Um, most recently I released my oregano socks pattern and I do have a design vlog of that too and I'm including it now as a finished object because Honestly, truth be told, I don't know why it took me so long to finish making the samples of this pattern. Um, I definitely got a case of startitis, both when it comes to designing and when it comes to personal projects as well. And that definitely didn't serve me very well, um, unfortunately. And now I'm at a point where I have to be kind of frantically tying up all of these loose ends when, you know, if I just started what I finished, then things could have been a bit more efficient. But hey, it's a learning curve, as I mentioned, and this is all, you know, this side of things is, I guess, fairly new to me. And um, yeah, it's, it's just, again, just to reiterate, like it's sort of different from when I just wasn't thinking about like deadlines or having to communicate with different people and I was just knitting stuff for fun than, than what I'm doing now. It, it definitely feels quite different. Um, so hey, now I did frantically have to finish this sample at the last minute because I was really coming up against my deadline for like when I could get the photography done and, and have access to equipment and so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, so I'm happy to be able to be like, oh, I've got both, both socks now. So obviously the cream pair um, is my four ply fingering weight sample. And so that took quite a bit longer and then my sport weight pair is the um, the special small batch yarn, um, which is Kalen by Black Isle Yarns. Now I'm mentioning this sport weight pair in, in particular because as usual the first one knit up really quickly and the second one languished for a while and one of the reasons that it languished is because <laughs> silly me ran out of yarn. So can you see something going on at the toe? There's actually a different colour at the toe. So I ran out of yarn. Now obviously being a cabled sock it just ate up quite a lot more yarn than a normal sock would do, an uncabled sock like a lace or just a plain stocking stitch one um, because cables take more fabric because of that you know the extra fabric that you need to do that twist. And um, when I weighed my first sock it measured 51 grams and this kind of sock yarn tends to come in a hundred gram hanks right or skeins so that was really annoying because it was just two grams of yarn in theory that I needed not very much um, and I'm gonna be honest now I was a little bit naughty because I did pinch a bit of yarn and put it into another project but to my credit not very much I didn't pinch very much and I thought about unraveling that project which I'll talk about later um, I thought about unraveling that bit of knitting and putting it into the sock toe but it actually still wouldn't have been enough when I looked at the sort of the physical area that it needed to cover it really wasn't that much so um, unfortunately um, no, this yarn was dyed you know this in, this green dyed with indigo um, was done in a small batch and there was no more available <laughs> um, to buy or in storage or whatever you know there was no more available on the market however um, I remembered that I had also been sent a very small amount of undyed white yarn so what I decided to do was to try and dye up some green <laughs> that as best as possible approximated this naturally dyed indigo. Now I knew that I wasn't going to do it with indigo, <laughs> I knew that I was going to do it with food colouring. So firstly I did that, I did it with you know blue and yellow, mixed it and created a green and it came out really really acidic, like so bright it pretty much looked fluorescent. Um, but that was okay because it still had the kind of green quality. So then I over dyed it using brown and red onion skins and just bits of onion. Um, chucked that in the pan, boiled it up, let it cool and then dye over dyed that yarn and then that really really brought the tone down. And the colour doesn't match, obviously my sock toe, my dyed yarn, where is it? It was here, it's rolled off somewhere, here it is. 
my yarn is, is much yellower actually than the original. But the original, you know, the natural dye is slightly mottled, you know, it's not a completely flat solid colour. And there were hints of yellow through the sock, so I felt like it wasn't that bad. But yeah, it's a little bit lighter, but kind of tonally it, it, it is in the same wheelhouse because it's sort of slightly soft and it doesn't have that acidity that the food colouring dye had. Um, so yeah, that was okay. It worked up pretty quickly and at that time it was also really hot um, here in London so it dried really quickly but I think just also having, knowing that I'd run out of yarn that I had to do this dyeing and then over dyeing, you know, as well as taking time that I needed to finish a sample, like just the idea of having to do all of that was just a bit of a turn off as well and just made me keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And I just took the snap inside my fern because I thought that actually in the natural world you do have that slight difference in hue between like the newer vibrant young leaves of the fern and the slightly older ones from last year's growth. So I thought that was okay. Yeah, and then so in the end I was really quite up against it to be honest with you. Um, lesson learnt, get my samples done just get them done, <laughs> done and dusted, um, and then move on to designing something else. So yeah, I'm delighted that my oregano socks are finally done. Um, I'm definitely ready to design some other things. I've got some other things going actually. I've got several sweaters going um, and I've got a shawl, a couple of shawls and yeah lots lots more ideas that just keep coming for things that I want to do to kind of have my own design catalogue for the Crimson Stitchery um, but yeah I do feel like I've got quite a lot of socks now so I'm totally ready to move on to non-socky kind of things. So Oregano socks, honestly, that felt like a sprint at the end of a six month marathon because I think I probably cast on for the first green one in January or February. So it's definitely been a while. Um, finished that. Then I also finished um, a project that I shared in May's vlog, um, which is this pink socks. So I think I had half of it before. Um, and it's my Twister Lolly sock, so it's another one of my patterns. Now, I am wearing it with an odd sock. So this one I knitted a couple of years ago. It's using the same yarn, um, using, I can't remember what it is, it's a free sock pattern off Ravelry. And then I made my pattern, which is a lot more detailed. As you can see, I did actually wear them as odd socks. So I've got my lovely twisted rib toe here, twisted rib cuff. And I'm just holding this up because you can see how much the yarn has faded. It's um, Coop Knit Socks Yeah 4 ply. Um, and then I actually I washed this pair of socks once and interestingly the dye has faded again. If I just take out my cast on you can see, oh, so slightly blowing out but hopefully you can get the impression that you can see the different qualities of yarn. So I guess, when, you know, obviously it makes sense that fluorescent dye would fade, but I guess if you want to keep things really bright, you just need to hand wash them. But personally, I kind of feel like life is slightly too short to hand wash everything, um, even though saying that these green socks, since they're non-superwash um, sock yarn, I will have to hand wash those. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm probably not going to hand wash like a superwash pair of socks that I'm just wearing, I don't know, just out and about and kind of in my daily life and not thinking about it too much. Um, so yeah, that, that's me. Maybe you're a sock hand washer, in which case good for you. <laughs> All right, so um, then what else have I been making? Okay, I'll talk about the crochet. So then I was um, clicking around on Ravelry and I saw this forum post about a bunch of crochet and I think macrame possibly bags that were featured in Vogue online. I don't know if it was in any of their print editions as well, but this was just an article, so I'll link to it down below. And I was really, really taken with a crochet granny square tote that they had that retailed for 300 and something pounds. Um, and it was all these different, it was 16 granny squares arranged into a square and circular bamboo handles. And I thought that's so cute. Now I don't have 300 odd pounds to spend on a bag, but I do have quite a lot of yarn. <laughs> um, the Ravelry discussion centered around how overpriced and expensive the bags were 
and like then it was like oh don't you think the people that made made them deserve to get paid i don't know i don't think that 300 pounds is too much to pay someone for a bag like if you want to if you like the bag then just buy the bag do you know what i mean like life is too short to be too tight i think <laughs> and just because i wouldn't spend that much money on a bag doesn't mean that they shouldn't find customers that are willing to spend on it anyway i'm not really getting into that as a debate but I can crochet. So anyway, <laughs> I decided to make a whole bunch of granny squares and that's what I did. So hooray for crochet. So I did this all using scraps and as you can see, I've started joining it together. And as usual, I had a kind of tight color scheme. As you can see, it's red, pink, gray, brown, green and uh, teal. And it took me quite a while to put, to kind of put them together. My partner was like, oh, your way of designing is organized chaos. Cause like you can see, I've got green here. I've got one green in every row, one fluorescent green. It was, it was kind of like playing Sudoku. Um, and some of the squares I love more than others, you know, some I'm a bit more ambivalent about like this one here, for instance, I don't love that as much as I love this one in the middle with the bright green, but I ran out of bright green. It was left over from a sock sample. So I had hardly any. And I mixed all the yarn weights. I've got four ply held single, four ply held double, sport weight, DK, I don't think I've got Aaron, but I've got quite heavy DK, like a normal DK and one that's very heavy as well. And then I joined them together with crochet. Now I did the construction of the bag slightly differently because I love the look of the bamboo handles, but I knew that, that that wouldn't be very comfortable to wear on the shoulder. So I just decided to do a crochet strap. And also the bag has got four by four squares, so 16. And then also the sides of the bag are another 12 yeah it would be the sides of the bag are another 12 granny squares because it's granny squares of the side panels as well as the front and back and that's just too many granny squares for me that's too much weaving in of the ends so i made my granny squares i think they're a tiny little bit bigger like maybe one row or something and then i've got nine on each side instead of 16 so that's way easier and then you can see that i um just went round the sides in some stripes. So you might see some things that are familiar. I've got this metallic blue. Um, and then I've got to now do a single crochet to join the last panel in, but I need to pin it into place and do it a bit more carefully. So I started and it didn't quite work out. So I had to undo it. And I'm going to be using this as a shopping bag <laughs> because obviously since COVID, one of the main places that I go is the supermarket. And I thought, why not make a nice jazzy bag to go to the supermarket in? So then I brought out this bag as well to show you. So I made this one last summer. also in crochet, also from scraps and leftovers. So, oh, I should say that this, this project, this granny square tote, yay, it's part of my stashless year. Finally, I've picked up a stashless project again. And this white one, this net bag that I made last year was also a stashless project. And I used it again recently when I went to the allotment and it got stuffed with onions and garlic and chives. And it works out really, really well as a produce bag, which is how it's used. Now, last year, um, I talked about how I made the handles longer because I like the idea of it, you know, having like a strap over the arm and not just having like a little small handle like you carry like a basket. And um, people pointed out to me correctly that the bag will stretch out of shape and get really heavy, especially when it's full of onions and potatoes. Um, and that was something that I hadn't taken into consideration because I've never used one of these bags before. But obviously that makes total sense because it's cotton and it's it really does stretch out of shape and get really long. So actually you need that short little handle because you need to really have it up against your arm so that when it dangles down, um, it's not going on the floor, which is what this was. So for now, I've just tied some knots in the handle um, and at some point, I guess I could, you know, like fold it in half and stitch it down. But at the moment, the, the knots are fine. And also this bag um, is going to be nice to take to the supermarket as well. So I quite like, you know, I can just, this one folds up so small. 
and then I can shove it in the tote and then I can have, you know, the tote for my groceries and then this little one, you know, I can put loose vegetables and stuff if I have to buy any. Um, if I can't get it off the family allotment, <laughs> um, then yeah, I can just use this little bag because normally in the supermarket, I, I, I've been refusing um, those single use grocery plastic bags for ages. I just carry them to the till and maybe annoy the people at the till because all the things roll everywhere, but I just carry them, um, which is fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with carrying it. But recently I bought um, a bunch of loose, very delicious and ripe plum tomatoes. And then that was a bit awkward to carry because I didn't want them to roll around in the larger bag that I had. So I actually think it would be better to group it. Um, and I made this net bag last year, as I say, using a free pattern, using leftover cotton thread crochet yarn. Um, and what was I going to say? Oh, I was going to say, <laughs> so crochet um, is not mechanised. It's one of the few things, you know, processes and techniques that are still not mechanised. So all crochet you see is done by hand. Hence why I think that you should be able to charge whatever you want for crochet, like charge thousands for it. If you can find people that are willing to pay for it, why not? Because it's all done by hand. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yes. So I have been seeing these bags being sold in Aldi for like £1.99 in the discount supermarket and they're cotton as well, they're not even synthetic. And I'm just like, wow, wow, £1.99. So someone is sitting there doing that or standing maybe, you know, by hand. Oh, I just can't even imagine how little they're being paid. You know, I think generally for this kind of stuff, like in fashion, you expect a markup of around 300% or it could be more. So I'm like, oh, even if the markup, the markup's gonna be more than 50%, you know, even if the markup was 50%, you know, you can be paid one pound to make this. That would be horrendous. And yeah, even in countries where they don't have such a strong economy, I don't know, I just, my mind was blown. 1.99 for a hand crochet cotton net bag. Like they must've got like one P or something for that. So anyway, <laughs> not good. Now, then this is what I mean by startitis. So I hadn't finished this tote bag, um, but then I was really enjoying crochet. And where's it gone? Where's it gone? Oh, here. I was really enjoying crochet and I was really enjoying granny squares and using up scraps and so on. And I thought, you know, I've been doing a lot of um, designing, as I said, this year. So a lot of my knitting and creativity is really turning into work, like honestly work um, and all of the associated emotions with work um, and with like feeling like you should be, you know, enjoying things more, but it's actually work, work and I don't know, all of this different stuff. Um, and I thought, actually, I know I need to make more of an effort to, you know, do projects in, in my free time, like in actual rest time that aren't linked to designing. Um, and I and so I thought actually just crocheting things with scraps is, is a really fun thing to do. I find it really enjoyable to combine all the colors in different ways and see what works and what doesn't. So I thought I could do something with a bunch of granny squares and like crochet them into a loose um, garment, like a very loose robe or bed jacket. So then I started some more um, and these ones, as you can see, I went for an even more muted colour scheme, but with pops of yellow. And you might recognise these grey and blue yarns. They're leftovers from my design project from last autumn winter, which is my brandy butter hat and ginger snaps gloves. So I added some um, yellow. But I, I mean, now I'm looking at them, I don't think that they're too bad. But last week I wasn't really very keen on them. But now I'm looking at them again all together and I think that they're very nice. So I don't know, sometimes you just need to take a break. So the idea is that I'm doing lots of very basic granny squares. And then I thought, oh, I could do some slightly different, more unusual ones and then have the different ones on like the edge of the jacket. So yeah, um, a new crochet project. But then I thought, no, 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 there's too many, <laughs> there's too many unfinished projects. So instead of finishing one crochet project, I went back to an old unfinished project, um, which is my, 
log cabin blanket. And the reason that I hadn't finished this blanket, oh, let me just, let me just grab it for you. So I'm making these log cabin squares in strips and I've been doing it since last autumn. And I've got four out of five strips. So here's two of them here. And the reason that I hadn't finished the project was because I wanted to film a tutorial. And then I'd been putting off doing that because for various reasons, um, I just, I just didn't, I wasn't able to record that tutorial yet, basically, which meant that the project was languishing, um, which was annoying me. <laughs> so then I thought, ah, what if I, what if I treat this almost like a, like a class? So what I'm doing now is I'm going back to working on the, on the, um, on the project, <laughs> on the blanket, but I'm going to get these squares to different stages. So, you know, this is like the starting square then this is like the first round and then like the second round and whatever. So I thought, okay, then I can at least do a bit of work on this project. And then, you know, when I'm filming the tutorial, I'll, I, it will be a bit of a, and this is one that I've made later series <laughs> coming up. So at least I did a bit on that. And yeah, I'm hopefully gonna be in a position to be able to record some more tutorials again soon. Um, yeah, this is just the thing when your home becomes a video production studio. <laughs> you know, sometimes one's home is not available as a video production studio because there are other things going on at home. Um, and that's life. That's, that's life. Um, right. In the last video, I almost sung, was it Cole Porter or is it? Is it Gershwin? I can't remember. You say tomato and I say tomato. And now it's it's turning into Frank Sinatra. So it's all the golden oldies going on at the Crimson Stitchery. And here in this lantern section is the naughty bit of green that I pinched from the yarn for my sock sample that I shouldn't have done. But as you can see, like that's that's not enough that, um, of yarn that I would have needed. Um, I needed more than double of that. So. And then because I don't have enough projects to work on and I also don't own any yarn, I had to buy some more. Don't know what's going on, honestly. Anyway, I'm not gonna <laughs> dwell on that, but um, long story short, I've bought this really interesting yarn. Here it is. It's called Kremka Karma Cotton and it is 70% um, cotton and 30% polyamide, but both of those materials are recycled. So recycled cotton and recycled polyamide, which is nylon. Um, and actually it, it feels like cotton. It's got that roughness to the texture. It feels like cotton yarn, definitely. Um, but I believe that, <clears throat> I guess it's kind of slightly lighter maybe because of the nylon um, and it's DK weight. So it's fairly heavy. Um, and I wanted to make a summer top. So I'm making the Framework Bralette by Jessie May. Um, I, I have been um, curious about her patterns for quite a while. I talked about it here in the channel before um, because I, I wasn't sure why, um, you know, not, not in a horrible way, but I just wanted to know why they kind of, they're so popular, um, mainly because I tend to see people knitting wool bras and um, I just didn't get it. Although, you know, if you live in a very cold country, then it's probably nice to have a woolly bra, but I, I wasn't quite sure, you know, um, what the function of a wool bra was, but some people made the very obvious point, which is that you can knit it in cotton. So to me, that made a lot more sense. Um, so it's looking very, very dark, but I wonder if you can get a sense of the details. It's just this kind of slip stitch and it's in this really nice indigo color. And um, I've used a lot of negative ease. I've gone down to size extra small, which isn't my normal size, but I followed a lot of guidance in the pattern to like keep sizing down, sizing down, sizing down, sizing down. So you can see like, if I hold that to my side, it's only coming across two thirds or just maybe even, yeah, maybe even like three fifths of my chest measurement, but then it, it stretches right out. And I've done one cup and I went for the longer cup because when I did the first shorter cup, it came out to like there, which is not enough coverage. <laughs> so now it's coming up more, more to like, yeah, more similar to this top, but a lot more 
revealing to be honest with you um, and it's pretty tight and pretty small but it's going to be nice you know with like these kind of high-waisted trousers um, oh yeah and I should probably mention this outfit as well um, the trousers I made last summer linen trousers with a jaunty little patch just a simple elastic waist jobby um, and the top I knit while I was a teenager using an old Rowan pattern and a Rowan four ply cotton um, and yeah still fits knitwear is stretchy um, yeah I remember being really happy to be able to make this because it only took like three or four balls of the Rowan yarn um, and at the time Rowan was really expensive it feels like the prices of other wools have caught up to Rowan I don't know if they've actually lowered their prices but yeah it feels um, weirdly weirdly more affordable now but I do know also that they've since been bought out as well by like a big um, big conglomerate yarn company that I think also own Ray Gear who make the sock yarn so yeah it's probably another reason why it seems a bit cheaper um, but anyway so that bra is nearly done um, from one triangle out of four and um, being DK yarn although it's cotton it's still you know quite thick and quite heavy so I doubt that I will wear it as a bra um, but what I have been enjoying lately is practicing quite a lot more yoga um, and I think it will be nice to wear as a yoga top actually. Um, what I like doing to be honest with you is wearing really loose clothes whilst practicing yoga which when I first started I, I didn't understand why because the fabric kind of kept getting in the way of my body and I think I needed at first the tight like leggings and stuff um, to help me understand my own movement but actually as I've got better um, I can kind of tune into the feeling inside my own <laughs> muscles and my bones and ligaments and so on quite a, quite a bit more than I used to and then having the loose clothing that is not restrictive um, facilitates that awareness and you know for example I don't really like to wear a sports bra while I practice yoga because I like to be able to feel the skin around my rib cage move especially when I'm breathing in different ways and doing different twists um, whereas it's kind of almost a, almost a distraction when I've also got something very constrictive um, and also inhibits taking very very deep very deep di diaphragmatic breaths um, but yeah I could wear this little bra um, while practicing with some loose trousers or if I ever manage to make it back into studio classes then um, yeah I could wear this as well so yeah lots of options um, okay so <laughs> I feel like that's quite a lot of projects like I finished the socks that was a very big deal um, the tote the other crochet the other sock the other blanket it's too much it's too much I need to finish some projects off um, <laughs> I just need to finish some things and finish some designs so that I can tell you about them <laughs> um, yeah but I'm glad to be back on the stashless train um, because to be honest with you that's kind of it, it it needs to be done sometimes when I think about all the scraps stacking up it's it's just too much although at the same time I'm like is it am I ever really going to be able to be stashless I don't know but I'm just working towards getting to a place where I'm more comfortable um, in terms of the possessions that I have basically let's move into conversational threads and in this section of this month's vlog I want to talk about plastic free July so if you haven't heard of it um, plastic free July is an international campaign um, aiming to challenge people to drastically reduce their consumption of single-use plastics and there's a lot of encouragement of swapping out whatever you can in your daily life for reusable items and you know seeing where and when you can make different choices and I've been trying to actively um, reduce the amount of single-use plastic that I consume in my home for quite a long time now um, and the reason that I'm hesitating is because for quite a while I felt a bit a little bit demoralized by a lot of these kind of online campaigns um, and sort of environmental campaigns because it all seemed very very individualistic whereas when it comes to single-use plastic the problem is with the manufacturers and it's definitely a supply chain issue that's coming from the top down 
it's a big problem that we cannot recycle our way out of. Um, for example, in the local area where I live, I recently found out that they actually only recycle number one plastic bottles and everybody in the whole area is throwing all sorts of things, plastic and otherwise, into their recycling boxes, none of which get recycled anyway. Um, so yeah, we cannot recycle our way out of this problem. And it felt to me a bit like, well, I can do a little bit as an individual, but actually, the difference that I'm making is absolutely minimal. But I want to talk about it on the channel because, you know, we do have this really wonderful dialogue between me and you guys, the audience, and between you guys as well, like online, in the comments, on Ravelry, on our Discord server, which is for Patreon supporters. So I thought it was worth talking about it there. Um, namely that I realised that for Plastic Free July this year, there might be another way for me personally to approach it as an individual, which is by tapping into the local community. This is something that I haven't really done that much of, in that whilst my family all live locally to me, and I, you know, we're kind of connected to the community and the wider community in that sense, actually I, there's just not really very much going on locally that I really liked the sound of, and a lot of that to do is to do with, um, you know, the amount of wealth that is in my local area, i.e. not that much. <laughs> and it often feels like all of the nice things that I like to do happen in central London, you know, in the middle of the city, whereas I live on the outskirts. Um, and that there just wasn't a lot going on that I liked. And um, I live on the commuter belt. So, you know, there's not a lot of money being channeled into the local area and the local economy at all, because it's all going into the centre of the city. And this is sort of like an urban development issue that I think affects places around the world. But actually there, I didn't feel like there, there is a very huge general community feeling, especially compared to other places um, where there's more affluent and just nice things like sourdough bakeries and things like that. <laughs> um, whereas where I live, you know, it's all about like chain supermarkets and so on and so forth. But... I decided to try and look into what things I could do in the local area and if there were any community groups that I could actually tap into. And I discovered that there were. In fact, I managed to join, um, I managed to find and join an environmental focused community group, which is part of a network that are at least national in the in England, um, if not international, I think they have other factions as well, which is called Transition Towns. So I joined the Transition Town organisation locally, made contact with the people that run it, and then I decided that I would put forward my own idea, which is to run Plastic Free July as a series of events for that community group, for the local community, and actually try and put together a working group to try and see if we can make the local area into a plastic free town, which again is a scheme that um, you can register, register for in the UK and that, for example, a lot of beach towns um, are linked up to for obvious reasons, you know, the plastic pollution, you can see it physically on beaches and in their oceans. Um, so, yeah, from being an individual like ranting and raving about like my neighbours putting the wrong things in the recycling box and me and my partner getting frustrated about everything being wrapped in plastic being really pointless, I actually stepped outside of my household and like took the leap to make a connection with people that I'd never met before and to be honest with you I don't really know anything about and I've managed to start something um, along with other people from that group and network that I'm very grateful for to, for helping me um, but I'm offering this as an example really because you know my own cynicism was saying oh it's no point you know me you know, buying bar soap instead of shower gel in a bottle if, you know, I can't get any delivery done at all that isn't wrapped up in, you know, plastic envelopes and like padding and, you know, I can't buy like a four pack of beer if it's not got the, you know, the plastic rings on it and, you know, just, just stuff like that, you know, rather than me just ranting and raving, I actually managed to find other people that were similarly moved and actually bring them to action and we're organising some events um, to raise awareness in the local area because I think, it, you know, for, for where I live in particular, it is, you know, it is an issue about awareness and education, I think, and a lot of stuff that we take for granted, you know, especially people like you and I who are using and watching the internet, you know, you come across these hashtag campaigns and stuff all the time and you almost don't realise that for a lot of people they just 
don't encounter that sort of thing at all. Um, yeah, so that's been kind of amazing. And, I, and I, you know, I've now got to do all of the hard work to actually do the events with the group of people that I'm working with, wonderful, wonderful volunteers. Obviously it's all done on a voluntary basis, um, but I'm just kind of, I, I, I'm surprised and I feel really pleased. Um, another thing that I'm trying to do is start a knitting group in my local area that I would like to attend. There are a few that are done in libraries that I think are organised by the libraries or by the local authority. Um, but they're all, they're all at funny times and I've not managed to go to any of them. And yeah, you know, and they're just, you know, they're, they're not quite the right thing for me. So I've decided to try and start um, a group, <laughs> a knitting group. And yeah, just kind of do things. I think I just sort of realised that my local area wasn't getting getting any any nicer um in fact it's getting worse and that maybe there was some small thing that i could do in my local community physically that might somehow make it a nicer place to live so that's my um, <laughs> little anecdote today about Plastic Free July. Um, I'm still looking for ways to swap out things to try and reduce the amount of single-use plastic that I consume. At this point, I've realised that, you know, certain things I can't do, like I can't get a milkman delivery with um, the glass bottles milk that, you know, gets collected and refilled. I can't do that because no one will supply that to my local area, my neighbourhood. So, you know, certain things I can't do, but other things I'm going to try to do, like I'm going to try and buy less biscuits that are wrapped in plastic from the shop and I'm going to try and do a bit more baking and just, you know, just little things here and there. So um, let me know if you're doing Plastic Free July and if you have any tips and advice or if there are any other, any good ideas that you've come across in terms of the Plastic Free Swaps. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up for today's episode. Again, I would like to say a massive thank you to everybody who has supported this channel, um, either with a coffee on ko-fi.com or through your Patreon membership subscriptions. I appreciate you so much. Um, as I always say, you are honestly making this happen, um, especially with the recent equipment purchase. We are now really, really close to 100 Patreon supporters, which is so exciting because when I get to that hundred, I'm going to buy a new computer, <laughs> which I so need for video editing and we're so close. Um, so if you're thinking about becoming a Patreon, now is a great time to do that because um, coming up at the beginning of July is our quarterly patrons knit night which will happen online. It's this wonderful international affair where we'll get together with our projects and, you know, have a little natter away um, about what we're doing and get to know each other. And one of the big things that has been wonderful about the Patreon is actually our Discord server, which is a private place in order to host discussions, you know, continue topics that have been raised through my YouTube videos, share projects, get advice, lots of lots of generous people over there. So head over to patreon.com forward slash the Crimson Stitchery if this is something that tickles your fancy. Meanwhile, I would like to give an extra special thank you to my supporters at the Crimson Queens tier, which is our top level. Thank you so much to Jamie Pung. Thank you, Angie Scheitel. And thank you, Shelley. I hope that you're all doing well. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again at the Crimson Stitchery sometime soon. Take care, bye bye.